Greetings, brothers and sisters. So this video is about truth on various levels. And I'm going to address some um, things I forgot to put in my videos from yesterday. And so the first headline is, this was the headline yesterday on the front page of the Huffington Post. Utterly deranged Trump has full meltdown over William Barr and Mitch McConnell. And them saying utterly deranged Trump, like, do you have a diagnosis? Like, <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be a news organization. When you're calling him deranged, like, what's your proof? What's your proof he's deranged? You're saying Jojo Magoo is more mentally competent than Trump. This isn't just about bashing the media and the left. This is also going to be, out, be about Trump and there's stuff to do with Tucker Carlson and I'm going to go through YouTube's community guidelines and things like this and just have people have a realistic understanding about their current situation and the situation of others. But to start with, the Huffington Post called him utterly deranged and said he had a meltdown. And they published a few small quotes from a statement, no link to the statement itself. And so this is from The Hill, Trump called Barr disappointment every sense of the word. But they don't publish the statement either. There's no link to Trump's full statement. I look for it. I'm sure it's out there somewhere, but I did, you know. I gave it the old college try, and I couldn't find it. This is being deplatformed. This is what happens when you're deplatformed, you know, that Trump released a statement, and it's almost impossible for someone to find who isn't, like, clicked into Trump's, you know, inner circle of tweeters and other people. Bill Barr was a disappointment in every sense of the word, Trump said in a statement issued late Sunday. Besides which, Barr, who was attorney general, shouldn't be speaking about the president. Because Bill Barr just um, released a book that the, you know, criticizing Trump for saying that election was a fraud and, and, and all those types of things, right? He, um, you know, he basically was hammering Trump in his book because he wants to sell copies. William Barr is a weasel, but they're all weasels. <laughs> like Trump's a weasel. You know, Trump isn't going to die for you. And I'll come back to that. Instead of doing his job, he did the opposite and told people within the Justice Department not to investigate the election. Trump continued, just like he did with the Mueller report and the cover-up of crooked Hillary and Russia, Russia, Russia. Uh, Trump didn't want Hillary to be investigated either. And I don't think William Barr was the original... I mean, Trump said it himself, that w that worked during the election, he told his supporters. But after the election, you know, when they were saying lock her up, remember I showed you that. They don't want to investigate the real facts. Bill Barr's weakness helped facilitate the cover-up of the crime of the century, the rigged 2020 presidential election. And then this is what Bill Barr said that triggered Trump. If there was evidence of fraud, I have no motive to suppress. But my suspicion all the way along was that there was nothing there. It was all BS, using strong language. So aside from the election stuff, Bill Barr screwed Trump over when he knew that the, there, was be, there was an investigation in Delaware and other places going on of Hunter Biden in September for a gun that his ex-girlfriend, who was his brother's widow, had taken his gun because he, they, she thought he might kill himself and placed it in a trash can, and the Secret Service and other people got involved. And there was another investigation of something else to do with him, and he didn't make this news public and didn't tell Trump about it, right? And he covered up this stuff for Hunter Biden, which interfered with the election. So Bill Barr did screw Trump over. I don't know about the election stuff itself, because they don't answer to Trump. That's the whole point of this thing, that they all have handlers and there is a system. And I'll, I'll get into this more as we go through it. Because Trump himself isn't going to put his life, on the line, his life on the line for you, even though he's saying he is. Nobody is, right? Nobody cares about other people more than they care about themselves. At least none of these people in a position of power, powerful people, famous people. They're narcissistic. And they're selfish, right? They might care about other people, but when it comes to a choice between you and them, they're going to choose themselves. Nobody in a powerful position 
So let's just go through this stuff with Tucker Carlson. Tucker Carlson said NSA is spying on him to cancel his Fox News show. And this is also from Huffington Post. They put a small segment here of what he was saying. Now, yesterday we heard from a whistleblower within the U.S. government who reached out to warn us that the NSA, the National Security Agency, is monitoring our electronic communications and is planning to leak them in an attempt to take the show off the air. They're monitoring everybody. I mean, that's what the Snowden leaks were about. You know, Snowden was controlled in his way. You know, whatever that dole, you know. Those three, the big three, Julian Assange, Snowden, and that other um, uh, Chelsea, what is it? Manning, Chelsea Manning, right? The, th- the big three whistleblowers. But they're controlled. They're all controlled, these leakers. But he's making it sound like the NSA isn't spying on everybody. They are. They have the ability to target any one person at any time because they're collecting everything, including your social media posts. And that's going to be part of this thing. Now, that's a shocking claim, and ordinarily we'd be skeptical of it. It's illegal for the NSA to spy on American citizens. It's a... Oh, yeah, it's illegal. (laughs) It's only illegal if they're going to prosecute the government, which they're not, right? They are not going to prosecute the government. The government isn't going to prosecute it itself. Crime is not a third world country. Things like that should not happen in America. But unfortunately, they do. Well, is it a third world country? (laughs) Because it's kind of going to be a third world country. It's just, it hasn't, you know, the dust hasn't settled yet. Do happen, and in this case, they did happen. The whistleblower, who is in a position to know, repeated back to us information about a story that we are working on that could have only come directly from my texts and emails. So I don't know if he's going to divulge the proof for what's going to happen here. But nothing's going to happen here. Like, this is something everyone should know. Because the system, the beastly system, is desperate and floundering. And it's not going to, you know, do anything to to validate any of this type of stuff, right? There's no other possible source for that information, period. The NSA captured that information without our knowledge and did it for political reasons. The Biden administration is spying on us. We have confirmed that. So let's go to this YouTube thing. Oh, first I wanted to say this. Pacific Northwest heat wave is buckling roads and melting power cables. And I, you know, have heard this over and over again. A blistering heat wave scorching Pacific Northwest this week, shattering record temperatures, 112 to 115 degrees in Oregon. I mean, you know. And there just seems to be a lot of this stuff going around globally. And here's some um, power cables that are being melted. I don't know if it would be melted by, well, I guess it can get heated above the actual temperature. But, um, you know, it's hot, right? <laughs> the summer is hot and it might be getting worse. And there's just going to be these natural and man made occurrences happening. We're going to, you know, I'm just. Um, putting this in here. I have had a lot of people ask me questions about this stuff to do with COVID and send me links and things. And I realized you guys are not aware of YouTube's changed policy that's been around now since January. So this is um, one of their ways that you would get a community guideline strike and would not be able to upload videos for a week. COVID-19 medical misinformation policy. YouTube doesn't allow content about COVID-19 that poses a serious risk of egregious harm. YouTube doesn't allow content that spreads medical misinformation that contradicts local health authorities or the World Health Organization, WHO, medical information about COVID-19. This is limited to content that contradicts the WHO, the WHO, or local health authorities' guidance on treatment, prevention, diagnosis, transmission, social distancing, and self-isolation guidelines, the existence of COVID-19. So that's across the board. That's pretty much everything to do with COVID-19. If you are putting information that is in any way contradicting 
these organizations. The YouTube's policies on COVID-19 are subject to change in response to changes to global or local health authorities' guidance on the virus. This policy is published on May 20, 2020. And so it's retroactive, and I'll get into that in a moment. So it's not just everything you publish after this date, but everything you publish before. If you're posting content, don't post content on YouTube if it includes any of the following. Content that encourages the use of home remedies, prayer or rituals in the place of medical treatment, such as consulting a doctor or going to the hospital. Content that claims that there is a guaranteed cure for COVID-19. Content that includes use of ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of COVID-19. Claims that ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine are effective treatments for COVID-19. Other content that discourages people from consulting a medical professional or seeking advice. Prevention misinformation, content that promotes prevention methods that contradict local health authorities or the WHO. Claims that there is a guaranteed prevention method for COVID-19. Claims that any medication or vaccination is a guaranteed prevention method for COVID-19. Content that recommends ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine. Claims that wearing a mask is dangerous and causes negative physical effects. Claims that masks do not play a role in preventing or contraction of transmission of COVID. Claims about COVID-19 vaccinations that contradicts expert consensus from local health authorities or WHO. Claims that COVID vaccine will cause death, infertility, miscarriage, autism, all these things. More about the vaccine, right? All these things are about the vaccines. And so... It's across the board. So I want to explain this on a variety of levels because you as uh, consumers of this and people who are, for the most part, not risking anything, people who want to be given the truth, but only the partial truth, the truth that they want to hear, things that agree with their, you know, your internal belief system and are, you know, are subject to your confirmation bias. I mean, this is the majority or everybody. People just want to hear what they want to hear. They come to this type of platform, any you know, channel or any uh, people putting out information, looking for things that agree with what they believe on the inside. They want to be validated. And so it's not like there's a lot of people actually seeking the truth, truth seekers. Truth in its unadulterated form. You know, there is... Um, I've talked about in the um, Mahabharata, you know, there is a divine being, uh, you know, a uh, cosmic functionary in charge of the preservation. I've talked about the three elements of life, right? Creation, destruction, and preservation. And there's Vishnu who incarnated as Krishna. So this is the understanding of the, you know, the part of the, the Hindu philosophy or belief system about Krishna. Krishna incarnated twice in the Hindu system, once as Rama and once as Krishna. I mean, Vishnu incarnated twice. And Vishnu has two elements. Vishnu has the divine element that's known as Nara Narayana and the human element, the ego element, which is known as Nara, which all of us have. We have our ego, we have our subtle bodies, we have our causal body that's the soul, We have some part of us that's divine and pure, and then we have our ego and all these other things, right? So in his life as Krishna, he came down, uh, Vishnu incarnated as um, Krishna, his divine essence as Krishna, and his ego as Arjuna. Arjuna was the chief warrior and one of the princes of the Pandavas, the Pandavas, I can't remember which way to pronounce it, I think it's Pandavas, and so... He was in charge of basically killing all of his relatives who were on the other side. Amongst them was his beloved uncle and then also his teacher and people that he, you know, loved very much and didn't want to kill, right? He didn't want to fight against them. And so as the war commenced and Krishna, who couldn't, you know, promise that he wouldn't raise a hand because he had all these powers and things was just um, going to drive the chariot. They had these chariots, and I think it's a, 
a metaphor for maybe like spaceships or whatever it is. But anyways, he was going to drive Christian, uh, Arjuna's chariot and Arjuna just is, starts to weep and says, I can't do it. I can't kill these people. And Krishna, you know, knowing that this has to happen, this is, you know, something that's going to bring about the Kali Yuga, like this war, the Mahabharata is bringing down all these, you know, divine principles. It's something that has to happen so the Kali Yuga can take place. And he says to Arjuna, you have to do this. And, you know, Arjuna just can't do it. So finally, Krishna shows Arjuna his divine form. And this is two parts of himself, right? This is a higher developed soul with an ego that is, you know, somebody who has achieved greatness in terms of his, you know, his ego in, in the form of Arjuna. And Arjo, Arjuna is a developed person. And when Krishna shows his divine form, Arjuna gets like terrified and goes, okay, I'll fight. Just don't never show me that again. Right. And so this is something that's two parts of oneself. Right. And these are higher developed souls, a different form of human beings, because there was, you know, we're the new, the human beings we are now are of a different genetic and, you know, lower developed type of situation. And I've talked about that in other videos. The human beings that lived before lived thousands of years. I mean, it was just a completely different, like, you know, condition here on planet Earth. And Arjuna couldn't take his divine form. He couldn't take, you know, look at his soul, right? And that's, you know, somebody who was a higher developed human. And so most people can't even, like, come close to just having any sense of the truth. And I'm not saying I do, like, just, you know, I'm saying, like, I know this. Like, I know that people are limited in being able to see the divine, you know, the divine plan and what God has to do and, and people are terrified of like the true nature of God, right? Because of being, you know, what happens when people are in Stockholm syndrome, right? If you get kidnapped, you can see this with, you know, the whole, if you read anything about Stockholm syndrome or the, um, the Stanford experiment where they, you know, these, the psychological department turned their part of their, one of their buildings into a mock prison and some of the students were prisoners and some of the the students were guards and the psychologists were the uh, administrators and it got so crazy that everybody bought into it the prisoners they thought they were prisoners it only took six days and then they had to shut it down and the other students were abusing them the guards right i mean it was an experiment they were all just play acting but the psychologists themselves the main psychologist who was running it, he was the warden. And he was talking to a colleague who was asking, wasn't involved in the experiment. And the colleague was asking about the experiment. He's sitting there going, why is this bozo asking me questions? I have a prison riot I have to put down. And he realized like, oh my God, I'm sucked into this thing, right? In just a week. People get sucked into things in just a week, the drama. Like you can go get it a job and work there a week and you'll be sucked into all the the drama and like you know just just in a short period of time or be in a new social circle or watch a tv show and you completely you know be a part of the you know whatever's going on because that's what happens in the illusionary world of the earth so all these people are like i'm a truth teller and i want to i want the truth and you guys aren't why you guys aren't giving me the truth right why are you guys you know whatever accusations you have of people and whatever you expect from these organizations. And I'm talking about Trump. I'm talking about Bill Barr. I'm talking about Tucker Carlson. I'm talking about all mainstream media. I'm talking about all truthers. And then, of course, YouTube here. Let's get back to the YouTube thing. I don't have a problem with YouTube's community guidelines. There's one problem I have with it, and I'll talk about that in a second. I don't have a problem with it because I don't know what they're facing on their end. I don't know what the YouTube establishment, the YouTube company, I mean, I have a sense of it, was facing on their end. Do you understand this? Like, I don't know what they have to do or what pressure pressure they're under. I mean, they're, you know, they're a major corporation and they're not about truth telling. They're not truthers. They're not, you know, they're not um, the resistance. You know, YouTube and Google and Facebook and Twitter and all these things, they have to have controller money to have bigger platforms and 
if they went against their orders, they would be closed down or the people who went against those orders would be fired or worse, right? Maybe they would be threatened. Maybe their family would be threatened. You know, the people who are, you know, in the CEO level, the people who are in the upper echelon in these administrations of whatever it is, companies and things like this, people who have made it, people who have millions of dollars or billions of dollars of uh, controller money, right? That's what this is about. Famous people, celebrities, all these people, they have signed over their lives more so than the average person. And so there's no, they're part of it. Like they're part of a big mafioso organized crime type of a situation. And they don't get to say no. Like they don't get to say no. Like, you know, I mean, no one really gets to say no, but more so for them and their families and everything they have can be stripped away from them, right? They can be punished by the powers that be. And that includes the queen or any of the royal family or anybody who doesn't want to play their role who divulges the truth. Anybody who has a, you know, a conscious moment of having a conscience or, you know, they have some sort of uh, regret or they have a, I want to be, a, you know, I want to come clean. They, you know, they can't do it. doesn't matter how high they are up in the organization, in the, you know, capstone of the pyramid, because all the other people will descend on them. Even if they are, they're the top person, they can't say, all right, I'm going to tell everybody the truth. And even if they told you the truth or their version of the truth, most people wouldn't believe it. Like either you, they should risk their lives for you, right? Like people should risk their lives for you. The people at YouTube, the people at Facebook, their families, they should risk it for, I mean, like the people that leave comments on my videos and things like this that, you know, struggle with, with uh, facing the truth and things that, you know, I should or everyone else should risk their lives for you or not, not just risk your lives, but suffer for you. Like, why should they suffer for you? Look at what happened to Jesus, you Christians. And, you know, you have a lot of Christians who think that they would recognize Jesus if he was here. Like, if Jesus was incarnate right now in human form, you would recognize him, and you wouldn't. You didn't recognize him if you were around the first time. Like, Jesus had a handful of disciples. And I'm saying this because it's an example that most people can understand, especially, you know, in America, but this could be said for any saint or higher developed soul. When they're alive, most people reject them because they don't like the things that they are saying that you know don't align with their belief system and their confirmation bias. And all you Christians should realize this. There's some song, you know, this this country singer sings. I, I don't know the name of the song. Don't care. But he's talking about. You know, if he got to see Jesus or he was around at that time, but he might have been around at that time. And the majority of people wanted Jesus dead, like people who were briefly his followers. I mean, he has disciples and three of his disciples and the best one, the one who was, you know, the rock in which I will build my church, Peter, denied him. Judas betrayed him and Thomas doubted him. So three of the 12, you know all uh, had their moments where they, and it would have been 12 of the 12. They all had their issues, right? Because people have trouble hearing the truth and the limited truth that they were getting because it was limited, even, you know, in terms of the biblical teachings. He was just scratching the surface. It was an entry-level spirituality 101. The Bible is entry-level type of material in it, whether you, you know, want to hear that or not, it's the truth. Jesus would say it, right? And for saying that, you know, level of truth that Jesus gave to his disciples and people, they all turned on him. I mean, they were, you know, why were people so mad at Jesus? Why were there people in the audience watching him die, rooting for it as he carried the cross and he was being tortured, spitting at him and yelling things and insulting him? Why were they so mad at him? Like, what did he do to them that he deserved that? You understand this? You know, you're, the story that you get from your religion, the Christian religion, isn't accurate. It isn't, you know, what he went through is what people go through because human beings suck and they can't handle the truth. And so every, you know, member of every religion thinks that they would, you know, they would have been different, right? They would have been a good disciple. But what you think you know now about Jesus is stuff that's given to you that you've grown up with, right? 
that's been told to you by your parents, you've been indoctrinated in your religion, and it's what you think Jesus is, what you've been told Jesus is, and your version of Jesus, but you wouldn't recognize Jesus or maybe want to be around him. The majority of people didn't want to be around him. They didn't accept him. They didn't accept him as their Lord and Savior. They didn't, you know, they turned on him. I mean, he only had 12 disciples, good disciples, and, uh, you know, a, f a fourth of them turned on him. And, you know, they all were, including St. Paul who came afterwards. They all died torturous deaths at the hands of the powers that be for putting out, you know, a, 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 you know, a level of truth that's just the introductory level, the introductory level of spirituality. It's just, you know, it is the, it's the, you know, basic information. And so this is planet Earth where the powers that be, but also people themselves, don't really want to be reminded or told, or a better way to put it is, don't want to receive the truthful information about why you're here, what you have to give up, what you have to do as a, a spiritual being, what your sole purpose is. You don't want to give up the negative things of the system. Like everybody's so, you know, childish about the system. The whole thing is evil. You know, it's not like it's, some parts are good, yeah, sure. Some parts are better than others, but you want the things that you think are good, and you want to get rid of the things that you know that are that you think are evil that affect you and your belief system negatively. But it's the whole system; it's a materialistic system, and it's taking all of us away from God, and we're worse than we would be in another system, in terms of our character development, in terms of our you know connection to God and nature, in terms of our you know, being a, just a good spiritual person that is on their spiritual path, right? And so you have people complaining about YouTube and these other, you know, social media giants, but the people who run those things, the CEOs and the people who are in charge of it, are are connected to the beast. They're, the reason they're so big, the reason that they have, um, you know, a, a large platform is they have all this money and they are doing the controller's bidding. And so there was a brief window where the internet opened up and you could talk about anything on YouTube. You could talk anything, uh, talk about anything on social media. And the so-called controllers realized that it was going to undermine the, you know, the integrity of the system, which is that the system is based in perception. And when people were awake enough to the, you know, negative side of the system, which is quite, you know, comprehensive. Because what we can look at is the pleasures and comforts and things that we're addicted to that people don't want to give up. Those things are, you know, the preferable things, the things that you like about the system. But then when you understand what it takes to deliver those things to you and the suffering across the globe, you know, the the suffering in these foreign countries and wars and colonialism and all these things that hurt people all around the globe. You have all these people, these fake woke people crying about colonialism, but they had no problem with Barack Obama invading Libya, right? And, you know, destroying that country to keep the colonial and you know, petrodollar going and the colonial interests, you know, the American privileges going. People don't care about it when it's their privileges. They don't care what it takes, you know, what has to be done to other people to keep your lifestyle and your privileges going, right? It's just when you feel oppressed, when you feel your rights are being violated. People's rights are being violated all across the globe right now to deliver to you your American lifestyle. That is a truth that all of us have to accept, that we are living, you know, on the benefits of the, you know, the crimes against humanity that our leaders are doing. And if you want to go back to living in the dark ages, you know, then sure, if you're somebody who is willing to do that, I mean, not just say it like you're drunk, I'll give it all up, right, you know, <laughs> in some drunken moment, but, I'll, you know, making a an, an informed decision for you and your family to give up, you know, your lifestyle and all these things and go live like one of these third world country people that are being exploited and having their resources stripped from them, then go ahead, right, you know, that's something you can choose to do. You can give up all your worldly possessions like Buddha did it, right? Buddha was a prince. He gave up his princehood. He gave up his, you know, everything. 
and walked into the woods, right? And started to meditate because he saw all this horrible stuff going on and he had been isolated as a royal person. And so there's been such cases of that. But people don't want to give up these things. You know, in the heartfulness meditation, many of us who do the meditation have had the experience of the divinity of the masters of the system. People have risen up to the highest level of spiritual attainment. And we've experienced that in one level or, or another. We've been convinced on an experiential level. And there's lots of people in India, and they are trained, unlike America, Indians are trained that there are going to be saints and higher developed souls in their country, and that you can find them, and some of them do. So it's part of their you know, their belief system. So they're much more, they're better at it because it's, it's something foreign to us here in America and Europe and these other countries. We don't believe that. And our religion has said there's only one guy and there's never going to be anybody else. And so people in India already have this predisposition to finding a higher spiritual being. And so it's easier for them to accept a spiritual master, a spiritual guru, or whatever it is. And in the heartfulness system, there's like examples of this, where the master of the system requests something, and people just ignore it. It happens all the time. And these are people who are convinced on a heart level and, you know, love the master of the system and understand their, you know, at least have a sense of their spiritual accomplishment and still disobey. And so, you know, I'm saying this just so people understand that this happens and it happened in Jesus's time, and it happens all the time for higher developed souls. It's something that, you know, weighs on them. It, like, hurts them in ways, right? That, you know, the people that they've come here down here to serve, in a sense, I mean, they're doing God's bidding, God's work, but the people are benefiting from this work, and those people who claim to love them and be devoted to them oftentimes don't listen to them, only listen to them when it's convenient and it goes with their confirmation bias. One of the examples of this is that Master Charji, the third master of the heartfulness system, was talking about the caste system in India, and that it was, you know, a horrible system. And he said that he wanted all of the Indian Abhyasis, that he suggested that they give up their caste names, that they're, you know, I don't really understand the naming system in India, I've had it explained to me, but they don't have like a, you know, like Romano that's passed on or whatever it is. But they do have a surname, a, a caste name that other people in India, Indian people would recognize what caste they were based in this name. So we requested people to leave their caste who did the heartfulness meditation. And I know this because I heard him give this talk and he said that he had asked over and over again for people to do this. And he said only 11 people did it. 10 of them were untouchables, which was the lowest caste, right? And so they had, you know, every reason to do it. And one of them was one of his sort of inside people who I know, who, you know, who was, uh, you know, somebody that people would know. But only really one person did it, right? Even though he asked everybody. Now, you know, you could judge all the people like I could judge them knowing what I know about who he was. And it'd be much easier for me as an American to give up my last name. I mean, it'd still be hard in terms of, you know, I mean, there's things that just suck about changing your name. But women do it all the time. They take their husband's last name. But it's not as hard for Americans to conceive of something like that. And certainly people who, you know, are looking from it from the outside. But I didn't grow up in India. You understand this? Like, I didn't, you know, I don't know what I would do had I come from that culture. And so people think all the time, oh, they would have been Jesus's best disciple. If you know. <laughs> It's only because you're thinking about it 2,000 years later. At the time, you know, would you even recognize Jesus now? Like you say you would, right? You think you would, but it wouldn't be the pictures and the description. I mean, it's a guarantee that Jesus wasn't some European looking, blonde, blue eyed guy, right? I mean, the way that Jesus is pictured now, there was no people in the Middle East that looked like that. You know, he wasn't European, like he came from, he was Jewish, and he came from, you know, the part of the world where people have darker skin. I mean, everybody speculates 
what they think Jesus looked like, right? And so, you know, if you can't even accept him, you know, what he actually looked like in his life, what about a life now? If some person, you know, had the conscious awakening that they had been Jesus in a past life, and they told everyone, yeah, I was Jesus, would you be able to, on a heart level, know if whether they were telling the truth or not? On a soul level, would you be able, not just your mind or your ego, no, that person doesn't act like Jesus would act, or that person, you know, judging it from your mental capacity, because that's what people would react, that's how Christians would react, because that's how people are. So, you know, everyone thinks that they would be different if they, if they had been there during that time, but you wouldn't have been, <laughs> you know? It's something where you can't recognize godly people now. There are godly people in your life, in the world, and people are rejecting them on a daily basis because they tell you things you don't want to hear that bruise your egos and make you feel butthurt. And so very few people can accept even the bare basic remedial truth. And having done this YouTube channel now for a number of years, I understand it. Like I understand a lot from this YouTube channel. It helped me understand and be more empathetic to the master, the masters of the heartfulness system and even to companies like YouTube and even people like Trump and Bill Barr and all these other people because you, know, you don't know what it's like to be them. You don't know what people go through to deliver services to you and you just have your complaints. People have their whiny little butthurt complaints and you know they give you, try to give you advice and they think they know more and you don't because you're not doing it, right? You're on the sidelines. You want people to deliver the truth that you want to hear you expect the companies and the CEOs to risk their lives for you, their families' lives, or just be ruined financially or ostracized or all the things that would happen to them when they're not even truthers themselves. Why are you whining about YouTube? You know, and you think, oh, wow, you go to BitChute. Well, who owns BitChute? Like BitChute is, you know, that guy Jeff C. discovered this, that it was a block away from the 77th Brigade, which is in, in England, in Britain, where all their government trolls are, all their military trolls, internet trolls, and things like this. You know, they all have their internet people spying and doing all these things, right? And that's where their hub is, and a block away is <laughs> the headquarters, the, the, you know, the company that runs BitChute. And so all of these platforms, at some point or another, if they became a threat to the beast or the system, or if they, you know, if they were independent in the first place, would have to answer in one way or another. And they're going to have to give up something. They're going to either give up your personal data and your comments and all these things or whatever it is. So if you think, oh, like BitChute is better than YouTube because they allow more content that you want to hear, you know, they don't have the, the same strict community guidelines. Well, you know, that's a limited way of understanding it, right? Because of the size of the platform. Each platform, you know, the, the more people that exist on a platform in terms of YouTube being uh, obviously the, the hugest one, and then all the other various platforms don't have the reach or scope, right? And so most of the people watching, you know, things on BitChute already are convinced. They don't, you know, they're not going to be swayed in one way or another. So there's no danger to the beast. It's just, you know, people in their own little isolated communities on some little obscure part of the, the internet. And so it's not, you know, that's why you can talk about anything in some of these other platforms. And one of the reasons I've been able to survive on YouTube is I'm realistic about it. Like I understand what YouTube is. I mean, it took me a while in the beginning, you know, I was upset by the so-called censorship because it went from where you were able to pretty much say anything to where they were just imposing these community guidelines retroactively. That's probably the one thing that I can say that I have a problem with, that if you talked about COVID, like I had videos where I mentioned COVID, in a way that now goes against the community guidelines, you have a strike. They can give you multiple strike for various videos that you've had in the past that you were, you know, you were obeying the community guidelines at the time, but now those videos that you may not even remember saying something, right? I make hours of content, you know, on a you know, daily basis, and I have videos out there. Now I have to go through them 
and watch all my old videos again and then republish them. That's one of the reasons why I haven't published my old videos. It's very time consuming. I don't know when I'll be able to do that. And so every time they change the community guidelines and you have one line in it where you say something about COVID that's no longer acceptable, you get a strike for that instead of them just deleting the video. I wouldn't have a problem with them deleting the video. You understand this because, you know, all right, they have to scrub their site of this type of information. They've been ordered, whatever it is, right? Not my problem. I'm not going to complain about it. They, you know, uh, there's a lot of things that YouTube does or has to do to keep their platform going that have nothing to do with me or I don't need to know about it. I just, all right, whatever. Like I said, like I don't get upset about things I don't know anything about. Like I don't know what it, what YouTube and the executives at YouTube have to go through. So I'm not going to, you know, get all mad at, oh, why are you guys censoring? Because, you know, I, I have a, a general understanding that they're not a truther. You know, obviously they're not a truther network, that they've allowed these things to be a part of their platform because it's been financially beneficial for them. But the people that pull the strings are telling them, yeah, you got to shut some of this stuff down or whatever, control it or whatever they're saying to them. And so that's the nature of YouTube. That's the nature of Facebook. That's the nature of Twitter, right? They're part of the beast. So why am I complaining, you know, when they're doing the beast bidding? It's not, you know. But the same thing I would say about, like, the masters of the heartfulness system I talked about. And then just, you know, people in general, everybody's struggling to get by, right? Just it's a bad time. And, you know, we've been led in the wrong direction. And everybody's just floundering as our system comes to an end. So I'm much more forgiving and, you know, I mean, it sounds like I'm being judgmental, but I'm really not because most of this stuff really doesn't affect me and it isn't being done to me. Like, I don't look at it like things are being done to me, but it's, you know, people's unrealistic belief, their version, like your version of Jesus, your version of Trump, the liberals version of Biden. It's your fictitious internal version of somebody, believing Trump was a savior, believing Q is whatever Q is, right, to you, believing, you know, the liberals believing Biden is a great man or whatever, believing that the, you know, the people at CNN are giving them real news and they're trustworthy, believing that the doctors, you know, all these people are, you know, all above um, reproach, right? Everybody has their delusionary beliefs. This is what happens when you have a mentor, when you have somebody who you put on a pedestal, ultimately they're going to fall. Ultimately, when someone's put on a pedestal, you're going to, you know, at some point you're going to see them in a unfavorable light. It's happened to people in the heartfulness system who, you know, they're around the master of the system and they start seeing the master in, in their human form and some of their human flaws and things. And they lose sight of the divinity that is, you know, that they've achieved their spiritual achievement. And this would happen to pretty much every Christian if they were truly, you know, if they got to be around Jesus in real life or any saint or any persons like that, or if you're around Trump, because Trump isn't going to die for you. Trump is a flim flam man and he's very narcissistic and selfish. You know, Trump isn't dead, nor is he in jail. And if he was, it wasn't because he was fighting for you. It was because he you know, made bonehead decisions uh, based on his own, you know, his own arrogance, right? And so for people to crucify Bill Barr for not standing up for Trump, you know, Trump wouldn't, you know, wouldn't do that for anybody else. Trump wouldn't do for Bill Barr what he's demanding Bill Barr do for him. You understand this? Like it's your delusional version of Trump. You've made Trump into something he's not, Right. Just like you can see that the liberals and the Democrats and the media have made Joe Biden into something that's so easy for us to poke fun of, but they're you know re rearranging reality because they need to believe in something at a you know a very crucial and scary time for people who are you know sheeple in nature, and at the very centerpiece of this problem, at this whatever you want to call it, this lie that most truthers aren't even willing to look at is that what it takes to deliver your lifestyle is essentially evil. It's a colonialistic model. 
it's disrespectful to the earth. It exploits people around the globe, stealing their resources, leaving them in poverty. That's what it costs to have the lifestyle that we have. The people who are, you know, in the middle class and above. I mean, even the poor people in America. For all the things that you have, all the privileges we have that we don't, you know, take for, that we take for granted, comes at a price to other people in other parts of the world, even other people in our own country, and at the price of the earth and other things. And so what the controllers do and the people that do their bidding, their minions, the people in the media and politicians, is that they create an illusion for all of us that, you know, we deserve and everything that we have in terms of our, you know, our materialistic lives, right? Everything that we have in our materialistic lives is not coming from a criminal activity, not coming from ill-gotten gains, right? And that's a lie. That's the basic lie at the bottom of our system, that everything that we have in our system comes from like demonic practices, things that go against the will of God, the rules of God and divinity. And so all of us have to confront that because we are addicted to that. You know, that's the lifestyle that we have been addicted to, and it's very hard to change, is what I was talking about in my videos from the last couple of days. It's very hard to, you know, change those things. Just like it was, I've talked about that time in the past when our ancestors, our great-grandparents and grandparents, were lured off the farm, lured off the tribal. People were not always lured. Sometimes they were forced from tribal situations, from agrarian communities, from village-based situations into the city. And they had to give up their skills and they had to go to work for, you know, have a specialized skill and go to work for eight hours and have everything else done for them. And in the beginning, it was very difficult. It was difficult for these peoples, you know, homesteaders and tribal people and indigenous people who were much more developed and much more in tune with the land and things, to go into a city environment. They hated it. They didn't really care about the privileges. And, you know, but they got sucked in. They started to drink alcohol, started to, you know, self-medicate or whatever it is. And they started to indulge in some of the, the things they had. And they started to enjoy their free time. And over a period, they adapted to what we now think about as our modern way of life. And so it's going to be much harder to go back from these addictions and this modern way of life to a more agrarian, I mean, just in terms of, you know, dealing with people, everybody knowing each other's business and having an extended community and having, you know, all these things. There was an intentional community. My family and I bought cows from Twin Oaks. It's a famous place in Virginia. It's based in Skinner behaviorism. And there's a hundred people there all the time. And they sell hammocks and they have a lot of, you know, they have an epic garden, they grow their own food and they have cows and everybody has, uh, you know, an assigned work and task and everybody gives up their money and things when they enter into the community because everyone has to be equal based in the, the model. And I was talking to the guy who, you know, he was, you know, these people that we bought the cows from were interesting, they were likable people. And I said to him, you know, what is it like living here? And he said, it's like mar being married to 99 other people. And so, you know, there was that, right? And so this is, you know, something that's on a social level, people are going to have to adjust themselves because you can be so much more isolated, ind independent, and don't have to deal with a community and your neighbors and things, which in the future, you're going to have to go back to having an agrarian type village situation. And socially, that's going to be tough. There's all these adjustments people are going to have to make to adapt to, you know, the system collapsing. So going back to this idea about YouTube, right, and, you know, their various ever-changing community guidelines, this is what they have to do to keep their platform going. This is what they have to do. There's no choice in the matter. And you can be upset about it, you can be mad at them, but really it's a lack of understanding because you don't know what it's like to run YouTube, you know. You don't know what the pressures are. You don't know, you know, how you've had to sell your soul on a corporate level or all the things that go into something like that or at Google or at Facebook or at Amazon or any of these things, any companies, Microsoft or Apple 
or any of these software companies or you know any kind of a company you know what the pressures are what the economic pressures are what the controllers want from you and you know there's a price to be paid for being successful there's a very high price for being really successful and so you have to learn to adapt and you have to really learn the rules of where where you are right these are the rules like they have rules on youtube now i am constantly being sent things about covid and I'm always kind of baffled why people are sending me things because I already made my decision. Like I went through the illness and I, you know, I have my personal, my family's health regimen and routine. So I've already made my decision. So like I don't need the information, you know, and I'm, I can't share it. Like it's not, you know, I'm not upset at anybody. No one has to apologize. When I talk about these things, you don't know, like people like, oh, I did that. I better apologize. You don't have to like, I don't. I'm not viewing it like that, like individual people, just that on a, a weekly basis, people are sending me stuff about COVID. And it's, if it's funny or it's a meme and it's made to make me, make me laugh, that's one thing. But people send me stuff all the time about, you know, things I'm like, why would you think I would like this? Like, I'm not talking about the COVID stuff. I'm just talking in general, like weird stuff that, you know, based in, if you're watching my videos, I would think you would know me enough to know that I wouldn't value like weird truther stuff or extreme right wing stuff that I know is bogus or whatever it might be. You know, it's not stuff that I cover here. Like you should get a sense of the thing. And the most important aspect of my YouTube channel, the only thing that's a deal breaker for me, if I couldn't talk about it, would be the heartfulness system and a spiritual solution. And maybe at some point they'll censor that and then it'll be pointless for me to be here. But like all these other things, the celebrity stuff and the, you know, whatever's going on in the news and politics, you know, it gets old for me anyway. And so if it's something you can't talk about anymore, it's no big deal for me because it's not the point of the channel because that's not true awakening. Like people think they're awake, you know, because you've gone one layer down into a new realm of disinformation. You're throwing off the sheeple level disinformation, but now you're on the truther level disinformation. And there's so much disinformation and, you know, false claims and things announced as facts in the truth or realm that it isn't like, you know, truth at all. Right. And there's a lot of arrogance where people are like, oh, I'm so much better than the sheeple. Yeah, sure you are. Right. Like we all get sucked into believing things that aren't true. And then, you know, God shows us, well, this is wrong. And most people reject it. That's the problem with life on planet Earth. God shows you. God mirrors back to you the, you know, things in your system that are impure and wrong and things you need to correct. And most people reject God on every level. That's why I say that people say they, you know, for example, I'm just using Christians because the majority of people who watch this channel come from a Christian background. The more majority of Christians say that they love Christ and they worship Christ. But if they met Christ in real life, they would not, you know, measure up to your illusionary Christ that you believe inside yourself and you would reject him. You know, you would feel hurt or betrayed and you would say all these things and, you know, he's telling me things I don't want to hear and, you know, all these things. I mean, that's the, you know, delusionary nature of the human life. Only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano definitely reporting from the Apocalypse and the Ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.